Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to welcome up now for the second portion of our program, Mrs. Debbie Gallery. And uh, I don't think we've ever had Debbie come here to Seattle, have we? We've never heard from her. People know her or know of her, but um, she's not Reverend Shanker, uh, but she uh, brings a lot of valuable information, a nice balance to uh, the, the vertical talk he gave. Not that her information isn't vertical, but it's more application, real world down to earth application of the truth. So let's uh, give Mrs. Gollery a warm hand and we'll get started. He's true though, I, I'm, I'm actually gonna be very horizontal. <laughs> Um, you remember that part in Reverend Shanker's presentation this morning where he asked all of you, you know, who's been thinking about what you want to do in terms of your marriage before uh, 2013? And like, no one put their hand up. Do you, do you remember that part? Don't you think that's rather indicative of our community right now? Yes. And I don't think that this group is any more unique than other groups around the country. And, uh, <coughs> you know, I feel very grateful to Ingenim because in the past, when uh, people like myself have tried to do workshops like this, um, <clears throat> it was very hard for us to get a response from the community because we had a lot of uh, resistance in the form of things like, I can't go to a blessing workshop because if I go, people will think I'm struggling with my blessing. And oh my gosh, that would not be good. This is a very common reaction. <laughs> or, it's not vertical enough, so I better not go. I can't trust the information that I might get. So, <clears throat> here I am. <laughs> not vertical enough. <clears throat> but those kinds of old-fashioned ways of thinking have prevented us from growing, don't you think? Yeah, and so we're in the middle of having like a paradigm shift. So my hope is that all of us first gen, and I'm not too worried about the second gen, they're already ahead of us in this paradigm shift, but us first gen have to really work on it. The paradigm shift is going from, oh my gosh, what will pe people think if they find out that I'm struggling, to of course I'm struggling because I'm growing. And it's smart and healthy to get all the help and information I can get so I can be the best person and develop the best marriage and have the best family I can possibly have. That's the paradigm shift that we're in the middle of. Are you willing to get on the bandwagon for this? That was the worst response I've ever heard. Let's try that again. Jan, don't say anything. I know Jan is always going to say yes because he's on the same bandwagon as me. I know this already. How about the rest of you? Are you willing to try to make that paradigm shift? Yes. Okay. So one of the best things that we can do this year to prepare for 2013 is self-reflection about who I am, really, and what kind of marriage do I have, really, and what, you know, how much have I been able to put into practice what I say I believe, don't you think? So that's what this afternoon is gonna be about. And I'm hoping it's going to be a little bit challenging. And I know that there will be some people in the audience that will feel more comfortable with the stuff I'm talking about than others. I know there's a cultural difference um, and a gender difference. <laughs> Most guys don't like stuff like this. Um, we were all talking uh, this morning because um, Mrs. Heller was sharing about her experience doing the couple checkup with her husband. And she was like, let's do the couple checkup, honey. <laughs> and he was like, no, I don't really want to do it. Because he's a typical guy. <laughs> Plus he's European, so, <clears throat> so they did it. Eventually they did it, but like after they did it, he couldn't have cared less what the results were. It was just like, I did it, that's it. You know? And she's like, so look at this, isn't that interesting? We've learned this about our couple and this about our couple. He's like, nah, I'm going to bed now. So there is definitely a difference between genders but there's also a difference in terms of our cultures, don't you think? So I get that for some of our Western members, it's a little easier to hear sort of this kind of marriage education, this kind of horizontal stuff. I get that, and I get that for some of our Japanese brothers and sisters, it's a little more challenging. But is that okay if you're challenged today? Okay, and I actually am from the National Blessed Family Ministry, so some of what I say, even though it's horizontal, 
has a vertical background, okay? <laughs> Can you trust? Can you trust? Yeah. So everybody has the same challenge, right? That we want to, we want to be more the people that we think we are or would like to think we are. And we're all in the same boat. We're all in different places and we're all working on it. Actually, that's not true. Some of us have stopped working on it, right? So I think the number one thing that we can all make a commitment to is to, if we're not working on it, to start working on it. I think that would be the best thing that all of us could do in preparation for next year, right? Uh-huh, yeah, okay, all right. So <clears throat> I thought it would be helpful to start, now some of, I think some of you attended the uh, marriage workshops with Venta Leal, right, last year? So some of what you're gonna be hearing is a little bit familiar, but seeing as we only had one day, uh, Reverend Shankin and I talked about what skills would be the most important to learn, because there's so many things that I could have chosen to talk about. And my experience is that even if you know some of this stuff or you've heard it before, chances are good you haven't tried it. Because <laughs> we're kind of all like that, aren't we? Yeah, it was a great workshop, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's it, just file it back with all the other great workshops we went to, never use it. So the challenge today will be to use it. So I'm actually gonna give you guys a chance to use it here today. I'm not gonna just wait for you to go home and try it because I know that will be really, really hard. <laughs> so I'm gonna get you to do it today. So I hope you're ready. Yeah, you ready? Okay, so this, this talk is called Tweaking Your Speaking <laughs> because we all need a little help in our communication skills, right? Anybody here ever had a hard time connecting with their husband or wife? Yeah, just a few of you? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sometimes, no matter how much we love each other, we just can't seem to get our heart and mind across to that person that we love the most, right? <clears throat> I wanted to, sh uh, let me see, okay. There we go. Uh, quite a few years ago, I was working in the school system, <clears throat> and I worked in uh, second grade as a teaching assistant. And so teaching assistants always have to do recess, right? So when it's indoor recess, that's the worst, because that means you have to stay in with the kids, and they just run around like crazy people. <clears throat> so the good thing is that the girls usually sit down in color. The guys are the ones, the little boys are the ones that run around and drive you crazy. So I was walking around talking to the kids, and I saw this little girl drawing this. This is what she was drawing. I'm like, what is this? I was so inspired. I said, what is this? Oh, I'm writing it for my mommy. I said, can I see what's inside? Because it was folded over. It was like she was making a card. So this is what was inside. <clears throat> Once, there was a boy and a girl that licked each other. I thought that was cute. <laughs> I did not change that. That's what she wrote. <laughs> So they got married, <laughs> and they raised a happy family. I thought, this girl gets it. This is the principle right there. A lick, you get married, you have kids. That's it. <laughs> so I asked her if I could have it, and she gave it to me, and I've used it ever since because it's so perfect. But to me, it was just like a second grader. What are they, seven? in second grade, she got it. This is the purpose of life right here. However, even though we know that this is the purpose of life, sometimes it's not always that easy, right? The building a happy family part sometimes is a little challenging. So that's what I wanna talk about. The things that get in the way, even though we love each other and we want to be happy and we want to build good marriages, things get in the way. So what I want to talk about today is the things that get in the way that we can do something about. Because there's always things that get in the way that we can't really do anything about. Do you know what I mean? Like your salary isn't sufficient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or you have to work on Saturdays. I mean, there's certain things in life that you have to deal with. But there are a lot of things in life that we can change. That's what I want to focus on today. So I'm going, to make, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some um, communication 
attributes or experiences that we all have and some mistakes that we sometimes do that make communication more difficult than it has to be. So when I'm going through them, I don't want you to panic. <laughs> oh my gosh, I do that. I do that too. I do that. Oh my gosh. We do all of these things. All of us do these things. But the point is, as, as we become more aware of what we're doing, instead of just kind of living unconsciously, which is basically how most of us live, we can start to pay more attention to the way we are speaking and listening, and we can change that a little bit. We can tweak the way we speak, and that can make a huge difference in our relationships. Okay, so I'm gonna go through them briefly, and I'll try to give you some ex uh, examples so they make sense to you. There's four major communication um, danger signs that we wanna look out for in the way we relate to the people that we love the most. A lot of these apply not just to our spouse, but also to our children, especially to our young uh, adult children, our teenagers. So if you have teenagers in the home, or young adults, and I know most of you do, um, then you could use a lot of, you could pay attention to how you are communicating with them too, okay? So the first one is escalation, invalidation, negative interpretations, and, oops, I'm sorry, avoidance and withdrawal. So I'm gonna go through them a little bit so you can see if you're familiar with them. Probably you will be familiar with them in terms of your spouse. That's usually the case, isn't it? Yeah, my husband does that all the time. I never do that, but he does that all the time, right? So you might be familiar with them because your spouse does these things. So escalation is when, you know, it just heats up, right? Our give and take starts out pretty calm. Honey, did you remember to pick up the dry cleaning? You didn't. Well, it was the only thing I asked you to do. And then five minutes down the road, you're yelling at each other about something completely different. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, so that would be escalating. And there's different kinds of escalating. Sometimes it's verbal escalating. In other words, we start talking nicely and end up talking nice, not so nicely. Sometimes it's emotional. We start out very calm. Did you pick up the dry cleaning, honey? And we end up yelling. So our emotions get more escalated. And sometimes the actual content of what we talk about escalates. So what I mean by that is like, um, sometimes you might start out, uh, you might not, I don't wanna say that you might start out fighting about something, because you would start out talking about something and find yourself fighting about something. But the content changes in that the foundation of security gets taken away. What I mean by that is, say for example, I can't stand this anymore, I'm leaving. That, you're changing the content, you know, from, um, you know, this is really difficult for me because we're yelling, I hate it, to, I'm leaving, which is a whole different level in terms of content. You understand what I mean? So some of us do that sometimes, and it uh, makes it difficult for when there, that foundation t is taken away. So one thing I'd like to recommend to couples is to never say that. Never say that I'm leaving or that I, can't, uh, I'm, I want a divorce. You know what I'm saying? Even in, even in anger, because that, that sort of that just like opens the door to too much and takes away that, that uh, confidence. <clears throat> Invalidation is when, this one's a little bit harder to see. Escalating is usually pretty visible. You know, you just get more and more upset with each other. But invalidation is harder to recognize, but it's very painful when we're the, uh, you know, when it's happening to us. So invalidation would be something like, I would say, you know, I had a very hard day at work today. And my husband would say, well, what's wrong? I mean, you know, your job is so much easier than mine. No. Yeah, but today, today was really hard because my boss got mad at me. Oh, you don't have to take him seriously. He's such a nerd. Okay, okay but what's happening there? My husband is invalidating my feelings, right? I just want him to validate that I had a crappy day. Instead, he's giving me all these, ah, don't worry. Don't we do that sometimes to each other, right? We say stuff like that, like, oh, it's not a big deal. Yes, it is. I'm unhappy. 
validate that. That's all we want most of the time. You know what I'm saying? So if I said, I had a terrible day today, what I would really like my husband to say back is, really, I'm sorry. That's all I want him to say. I feel better knowing that he knows that I had a crappy day. Isn't that what we want? We don't want somebody to make light of it if it was a serious thing for us. So sometimes we do these things we don't mean to. We don't mean to be hurtful. We certainly don't mean to invalidate each other. But we do because we're not careful with the way that we say things and what we say. <clears throat> so it can get, um, you know, it starts out small like that, but then sometimes invalidation can get uh, bigger and bigger and bigger. You invalidate your, your spouse's feelings, sometimes without meaning to, or you make fun of them, because, oh, that's silly. No, it's not silly, it was serious for me. Do you know what I'm saying? So we start out by just putting down our, our spouse's feelings, but then if we're not careful, we can find ourselves invalidating our spouse's character. You always do that. I can't trust you. You never remember to take the laundry out. You know, like, we just start making these statements that put people in boxes and it makes it really hard for other people to change. And then we start feeling like, wow, he doesn't really respect me. Or she doesn't respect what I do. I'm working so hard and she has no idea. And, and then we find ourselves like feeling so lonely, even though we're, we love each other and we're living in the same house and we're working really hard to make each other happy, but we're missing the connection. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does it sort of sound a bit familiar? No, probably nobody's ever experienced that. So sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's way more obvious. And you've all experienced being in a room when somebody was doing that in an extreme way to their spouse or to their young adult child, right? And you cringe when you hear it. You can't believe that someone is gonna talk like that to the person that they're married to, right? Yeah, but the point is not to think about what other people are doing, but to think about what we do, you know? So do I do that? Of course, I'm not that extreme. I would never call my spouse a name, <laughs> right? We all have a little bit of self-restraint, but we might make fun of them. We might discount their feelings. We might not really listen. And after a while, it starts to wear on you, okay? Another one is negative interpretations. And this is also subtle and sometimes hard to see. And it often, um, it's difficult because sometimes, you know, we perceive things depending on how we're feeling, right? So, um, so if I'm feeling really good about myself, <coughs> here's a great example about a negative interpretation. If I feel really good about myself and very loved by my spouse, and he comes home one day and says, honey, I just bought us, uh, no, I just bought you <laughs> a subscription to the local gym so that you can work out. Now, if I'm feeling really good about myself, I might think, isn't that great? My husband loves me, wants me to get healthier, wants me to lose weight, wants me to feel good about myself, yeah? But if I'm not feeling good about myself and I'm not feeling secure in my husband's love, I might have a different interpretation of that, right? I might think, he thinks I'm fat, he hates me, he doesn't love me, I don't know what to do. Am I gonna be motivated to go to the gym? I don't think so. I don't think so. Not if I'm having a negative interpretation, right? So this happens a lot because, because the connection is severed somehow emotionally and because we just don't feel the love. So sometimes it's easy for us to just interpret something that our spouse is saying or doing in a negative way. <clears throat> so sometimes um, the assumptions that we make aren't fair and they're not based on reality, but they still hurt, you know? <clears throat> and again, that's why it's hard to, to detect it because especially your spouse, if you're, if you're having a negative interpretation of something that your husband just said to you and you try to explain it to him, and he has no idea, anybody have this experience? He has no idea what you're saying. Because he is confident that he loves you. But you think he doesn't love you because he just said this in this way, la di da. Okay, this is a, wa a woman over here that knows what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> 
So we want to be careful that we don't do that with each other, okay? It's because when we have this kind of, you know, negative kind of interpretation, we hear everything differently. We hear it more neg negatively than it was meant, and we believe the worst instead of the best. We assume that our spouse doesn't like us or doesn't appreciate us or doesn't trust us. And also, you know the Pygmalion theory? You all know that Pygmalion theory? Um, that's, um, that's an example of seeing what we expect to see. This was a research project that was done maybe 20 years ago in the field of education. Do we have any teachers here? No teachers? One teacher. You must know this. Yeah. Exactly, or what other people think you are. This is pretty huge. They did, a, they did this research project where they had um, three groups of children, all with average intelligence. They split them into three groups and randomly, and then they told the three different teachers that, that were going to have these kids in their classes, they told this teacher, your kids are above average. They told the, another teacher, your kids are just regular average, they're all doing pretty good. And they told the other teacher, your kids are all below average kids. And by the end of the year, those kids fulfilled the expectation of the teachers. That's how big a deal this is. You know, we see what we expect to see. You know, so if we, ex you, know, you know what I'm saying? So if we assume, if we have negative interpretations about our spouse, we're gonna basically turn them into negos. Do you understand? <laughs> we make, we fulfill, we get them to fulfill our negative assumptions. So it's very important for us to look at our thinking. If this is not just marriage education, this is like mind-body unity, taking responsibility for our thoughts and for our words and the way that we affect each other. Who better to be thinking about than our spouse? How do my uh, actions, my thoughts, and my words affect the person that I live with every day, that I say I love the most? <clears throat> and the last one is withdrawal and avoidance. This is very often a gender thing, right? <laughs> There's a guy who goes, uh-huh. Yeah, um, not always, but very often. And withdrawal is <clears throat> when one person is unwilling to engage in an important discussion past a certain point. And every, every couple has certain things that are difficult to talk about, right? You might have different things, but there's always a couple of things in every couple that you just keep trying to put off. Maybe it's finances, maybe it's the kids, maybe it's sex, um, faith differences. These are big issues that come up a lot with couples. And it's okay that we have differences of opinion. It's what we do with those differences. And if we never stick with the discussion, you know, then we can never resolve it. So very often one person, it's a very common dynamic in a couple where one person is always running after their spouse to try to have a conversation with them about something really important. <laughs> and often it's the wife <laughs> doing the running. It's a pretty common thing. Honey, we really need to talk, which of course are the words that most husbands hate to hear the most. Ugh, we need to talk. Oh God, no. Right? Do you like it? <laughs> most guys don't like it. It's like, ah! I gotta watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> I don't wanna talk, okay? <laughs> so, so some people just withdraw, like you know, we'll, we'll start talking about it, but then they get tired. Okay, well let's, okay, we'll talk about it. And then my favorite show's coming on at nine though, so we have to stop, <laughs> you know? So they just can't stick with it. So then you never resolve these issues and these differences, and then what happens? Resentment builds up, right? Yes, of course. I just want to talk about this and get it out in the open. And then your spouse keeps putting it under the rug. And the more your spouse keeps withdrawing, the more the other spouse has to pursue them. It becomes like a little dance. You know, the husband keeps pulling away and the wife keeps going in. <laughs> please, 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 can we talk? Please. <laughs> you know, or sometimes it's the other way around. I don't want to be too generalizing. Okay, some people though will avoid these kind of conversations completely. Not just begin them and then withdraw, but just refuse to have a discussion. And then the resentment gets really big. So I'm sure that everybody in this room has at least three um, subjects like that in their couple, because it's normal. 
it's actually normal. Research says that every couple has about seven irreconcilable differences in their marriage. Irreconcilable. <laughs> that means they will never see eye to eye on these things. Big things, not just I like plain yogurt and you like strawberry. Big things, you know? They'll never agree. But still, a lot of couples who have those huge differences get along. So it's not the differences that makes the difference. It's the way that we handle those differences. That's what keeps the unity and the good feeling. Okay? <clears throat> so, key points. <coughs> Even though, like, I don't want you to focus on these things necessarily, but I just, I'm bringing them up because I want you to notice them again. Because after a while, all couples sort of get into the groove. This is how we relate. <laughs> and it's hard to make any changes because we got this pattern. Right? How many people have a fight, the same fight, like over and over? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> right? You could, you could script it. <laughs> it's the same topic. He says this, you say that, then he reacts like this, and you react like that. You could just, like, you might as well just push a button. Okay, let's have the fight about sex again. Okay, honey, push the button. There it goes. <laughs> right? Okay, so we all have these things. So it's important for us to recognize what they are so that we can start to make some changes. Because the negative things, you know, people don't just fall out of love, right? Now, some of us are like almost empty nesters. Some of us have been blessed for 30 years, some for 10. We're all, we've all been married for a while here. Well, we have a couple of really, really young couples here. But, <clears throat> you know, love doesn't just fade away. The good feelings of love between a husband and a wife they just get eroded over time because we stop investing in the marriage. We stop investing in that relationship. We put our focus in other places. What we invest in grows and develops, right? If you take good care of the plants, they will grow. <laughs> if you forget to water them, they won't. Same thing with our marriages. And as for unification, it's a lot of us grew up in the era of what I call magical thinking. <laughs> we had a lot of magical thinking about blessing, right? It's all very magic. We get blessed, and then it's just magic. <laughs> we don't have to do anything. We're just going to love God and true parents and do providential things. And the rest just sort of happens. But we now know that that's not true. If we invest, then things grow and develop. If we stop investing, things erode. And so a lot of us empty nesters find ourselves, geez, like I don't even really know who you are anymore. We haven't really talked about deep things for a long time. Our whole focus has been the children. Whoops, who are you? <laughs> right? This is the kind of thing that I'm talking about in terms of this year. What can we do? Can we get to know each other in a different way? Can we reconnect? And these kinds of things that we do, these negative patterns, even though we don't do them all the time, we do them sometimes. And no matter how many good things we do, no matter how much we do hundake, okay? Even if you do hundake every day, but you don't actually invest emotionally, artistically in your marriage relationship, it will erode. Because doing hundake is also not magical. <laughs> It, it gives us a lot. It nourishes us spiritually. But it's not enough to make a marriage work. A marriage takes relationship and investment. Okay, so that's why I'm bringing these things up so you can look at them. Then you can take responsibility for them because they really have a big effect on our relationship. <clears throat> they predict the future much more than positive things. So sometimes you see a nice young couple and they look all lovey-dovey. <laughs> like that couple there, my, my son just got matched and he's like, whoa, head over heels in love. And it's lovely to see, but as a marriage ed educator, <laughs> it's really hard for me to be, um, it's really hard to be a mother and a marriage educator, that's all I can say. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, I, it's, 
I, I just know, you know, that it, it's, it's not enough to be head over heels in love. You have to invest, right? You have to invest in the relationship. And one of the best marriage educator, educators in America, he, he says, and he has been, he's proven that he can do this, he can watch a couple talk for five minutes and predict whether or not they're going to make it. Just by the way they're talking, you know, because the positives and the, the negatives and the very sort of um, uh, subtle ways that they're treating each other, whether there's respect there or not, trust, loyalty, you know, he can see it like that. So it's, it's amazing how important these things are. Okay, so to build a good marriage, the most, one of the most important things that you can all do is to stop or reduce or never begin, which is why it's great when young couples come, never begin negative patterns. So sometimes we hear this and we think, well, it's too late for me. <laughs> We've got a few and they're really deep. I don't know, right? But it's never too late to make changes in your relationship. It's never too late, never. Because we know the antidote to not investing is to what? Say that louder. Invest. Yeah, invest. So does it really matter if you always do the right thing or never do the right thing? Wherever you're at in the spectrum, you can make little changes that can make big differences. So I want to teach you a very, very basic skill. Now, here's the thing. We all know this. Like the, easy, the, the things that seem to be the easiest like are usually the hardest things to do, right? Yeah. So it's like that with this. And again, some of you probably know this skill, and I wonder, for those of you who know it, if you've ever tried it at home, <laughs> since you learned it, because that's always the challenge, you know? So <clears throat> this is what you do, okay? It's called timeout. Stop the negative patterns. That's what it's about. Recognize them. That's why I just went over some of them, so you could recognize, ah, yeah, we do that. And then, now your task is to stop them. So how do we do that? Okay, the first thing, <clears throat> notice it. Then, once you notice it, say, hey, we need to time out. Which means whenever you're having a talk, you're just shooting the breeze, and you start to feel like it's going a little bit, you're either escalating, or you're starting to, you know, you're having negative interpretations, or you just sense that it's going downhill. We always know when that's happening, don't we? We know when it's happening, but we're so used to, re you know, sort of acting in certain ways, it's very hard to stop it once we're on that path, right? That's the challenge. And here's the other thing is you never want to say to your spouse, Larry, I'm just telling you this, you never want to say to your spouse, honey, I think you need a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> never say that, <laughs> okay? Even if you secretly think that she needs one, never say that. You always have to say we, okay? Because part of this is doing it as a couple. Let's do this as a couple because we actually care about our marriage. Yeah, you all care about your marriages, right? You do, you're just stuck and you don't know what to do. Okay, so here's one really clear thing you can do. You know how father talks a lot about creating shimjung in your family? You know those homes, everybody's had that experience where you walked into somebody's home and it just like felt good? You wanted to move in, right? Because there was something there. There was like this shim junk feeling. There was some peacefulness, the, the way they related to each other, something, right? Don't you all want to have houses like that? Yeah, of course. This is, our, this is what we want in our lives. We want to create that. So if you want that, then here's a very simple thing that you can do. As a couple, you say, when we notice, either one of us, that things are getting a little icky, you know? then one of us or the other will say, hey, I think we need a time out. Then you have to promise each other that you will unite with that. And that's an important piece because, you know, we come from different cultures, right? So for example, I'm Italian. You probably noticed the way I talk. So my household was a little more intense, if you know what I mean, growing up. So I can handle loudness and intensity <laughs> to a different level than my husband who is from New Zealand and kind of British 
where they talked very calmly most of the time and never shared about their feelings. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so if I get like upset, I can go on there for a long time and I'm like into it and it's fun, it's not even that weird. But for my husband, it's kind of bordering on scary because it is so like not part of his reality, you know what I mean? So that's why it's important to unite on this. So if your spouse has a lower threshold for anger or for discomfort or stress in the relationship, you have to unite with it, even if you would like to keep going. <laughs> Can we just wait a little bit longer? Because there's a few more points I want to make. <laughs> we just got to get a few more words in there. <laughs> so again, this is something that you can do as a couple. OK, we want to change the Xinjiang in our family, between us. So we're gonna make this commitment that when we notice, one or the other, that things are getting weird, we're gonna stop. We're gonna take a time out, and then once you make this, okay, we're taking a time out, then you need to actually calm down. <laughs> this, is a, this is problematic for most of us, right? So um, everybody calms down in different ways, right? Some people like to meditate, some people like to go for a walk. What, what are some things that you guys do when you need a break, like when you need to sort of decompress? Huh? What? Sleep. sleep? Some people like to sleep. Yes? Cleaning up. A lot of people clean up. That, that helps, yeah. Anything else? Exercise? Anybody like to go for a jog or exercise or shopping works for me? I don't necessarily buy anything, but shopping, getting out of the house, kind of stop thinking about anything deep. I'm just going to go to TJ's and sort of veg for a while. Yeah. So everybody has their own ideas about what works for them to calm down. So what you do is you, you make a list of things, possible things you might do when you're really upset with each other. You call a timeout, and then you both go do your thing. And depending on how upset you were, you might be able to come back in half an hour. Okay, let's take a break. I'm gonna go read. Let's get back in half an hour. You might be really upset. I don't wanna look at you for just like the rest of the day. Can we like talk at nine this evening? You know, sometimes it takes a while. But the point is when you take this break to calm yourself down, you have to calm yourself down. You can't just like sit around. <clears throat> you know how you sit around and you just replay the argument? Yeah, and then you think about all the things you wish you could have said. I should have said that, because that would have made them change their mind, right? <laughs> That's what we don't want to do, okay? We want to actually calm down so we can get some perspective. Because, you know, once you start talking like this, when you're upset, you might as well stop, because you're not getting anywhere, really, once you're uh, fighting. And not only that, not only are you not getting anywhere, you start to get hurtful. Right? When we get upset, that's when we say stupid things and we hurt each other that we don't really want to do that, but we do. That's why it doesn't make sense to continue having a conversation when we start to lose control. Might as well stop, even though that is the hardest thing to do. So what I want you to do now, <laughs> those of you who are with your spouse, is to actually practice. Okay, hang on, I'm just going to skip that. Okay, I already said all that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so here's the thing. I want you to remember this important point, that you are actually responsible <laughs> for your behavior, <laughs> your feelings, and the way you express them. You're responsible for your thoughts, you're responsible for your actions, you're responsible for the words that you say. Your spouse is not the person that's making you get angry. Okay, let me say that again. <laughs> I know you think it's your spouse who's making you get angry, but actually your spouse is not making you get angry. It's the way you're reacting to what your spouse just said. It's you. It's all about me and my response to things. This all goes back to, you know, to spiritual life 101, mind-body unity. That's why I always like to remind people that you know our marriage is part, I'm going to talk about this later on, Marriage is our spiritual path. That's how we grow. It's where we grow. It's not like my spiritual life is over here and my marriage is over here. They are connected. That's why you can't just say I'm a very deep, loving, spiritual person. I just don't like my husband. 
that doesn't make sense. That's where all the challenges are going to be because that's how I can grow, you know? So it, that's why this is, this is part of our spiritual life, having this kind of conversation, okay? So remember that. It's about me and what I say or don't say, how much I can um, restrain myself from saying that hurtful thing in the moment. So we can always stop escalating and we can stop the argument. It's even better if we decide we're gonna do that together as a couple, because we care that much about our marriage. So we are determined from this point on, we're gonna just do a time out. We're just gonna stop being hurtful to each other. It can be done. And if you just did this one thing, if you just added this one strategy to your marriage, everything could change. See, that's the thing, we always think, like, I'm struggling and there's no way out. Because that's like, you know, Satan. <laughs> You know, it's basically negative thinking that just says, there's no way out, I'm stuck, I'm always gonna feel like this, there's no hope. But actually, making one positive change is like, it's like, um, what's that word? You know. Yeah, catalyst. It's like one little thing affects one little thing and affects one little thing and it just, one change like this can change your whole relationship. I'm telling you that. It's not that hard. It's hard to do this, but it's not that hard. That's why this is a really key strategy, especially for young people, because wow, if you could just stop it right now, it'd be great. But for us too, we can decide right now today. We're just gonna take responsibility because we care about each other enough. So that's what I want you to do. Um, can you pass the, I'm gonna pass out um, a blurb about timeout. Let me just, okay. Oh yeah, I just wanna say one more thing. <laughs> You gotta have a time in. <laughs> you can't just keep having timeouts. Okay, timeout. Oh, I don't want to talk about that. Timeout. That would work really good for those withdrawer type guys, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna avoid this forever. Timeout, honey. Timeout. We're so good. We're just timing out all the time, but you have to time in, or else it doesn't work. So <laughs> you have to be committed. That's the second most important part. So when you take your time out, you have to decide together as a team when you're gonna have your time in and you have to commit to it, okay? You with me there? Yeah, that's the most important point. <laughs> time in, commit to the time in. Be realistic, you know, because I'm not, I, I recognize we have children, we have lives, we have jobs, we have commitments, so we can't always Life isn't linear, so it's like, okay, we're gonna take a time out, and then you're gonna go to work, I'm gonna go to work, we're gonna come home, we're gonna make dinner, we're gonna give three kids a bath, and I'm gonna have a conference call, and then we'll have our time in. Because that's our life, right? It's not like, let's, it, it, it's like that. So you have to commit to it and decide on it before you split up, okay? <clears throat> and again, this is something that ideally you agree on as a couple and like I said earlier this is something that you can do with your kids and I have done this my husband and I actually this is hysterical because my husband is a typical guy who thinks even though he's married to me <laughs> and constantly like buying me these fantastic marriage ed books he's like yeah, you know he hasn't read one <laughs> it's like I learned it from you you know <laughs> but one time when my daughter was about 16 now she's 23 now, she probably doesn't even remember this. But one time she was around 16 and she wanted to do something. I don't even remember what it was, but I didn't want her to do it. Do you know what I mean? It was one of those typical parents and teenage disagreements. I was freaked, and my husband and I were both like, and so we just kept putting off the discussion. You know how you ever do that with your teenagers? Okay, okay well let's talk about it later. Let's talk about it tomorrow. We just kept putting it off because we knew it was gonna be a huge fight because she wanted to do this and we didn't want her to do this. So we just basically were not doing a good job of you know, <laughs> taking responsibility. But my husband said, why don't we try you know, speaking in a more heavenly way? And we did. And I'm gonna teach you the that, that um, strategy after this. And um, it worked like with our daughter, it was amazing. She was, and she was willing to do it because she she'll do whatever it would take for us to actually have this conversation. <laughs> so I'll share the rest of the story when I teach you the next strategy, but you can, all of these things, you can do time out with your kids 
they don't have to know <laughs> that you're doing it, but you know when you're getting possessed, right? We all know when we're getting possessed, yeah? Yeah, so when, you're, when you start to get possessed with your teenager, you could like take a time out personally because wouldn't that make more sense than to say hurtful things and be mean to them, and, right? Because we get crazy sometimes because we're so afraid, right? I tell all the t young people that come and talk to me, <laughs> oh, and they all tell me how crazy their parents are. <laughs> of course, I also talk to the parents who tell me how crazy their young people are. But when I talk to the young people, I always tell them, all the dumb, weird, crazy things that your parents do is because they're scared. That always seems to help them, and it's true, right? All the stupid stuff that we say to our kids, it's because we're scared. And actually, a lot of the mean things that we say to each other is because we're scared too, right? Yeah, we're scared. We're scared of something in terms of our relationship with our spouse, don't you think? I'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the point about this is that it encourages you working as a team. And that's really a healthy thing for you to do. You're on the same side. When we're fighting, we, f we put ourselves on opposite sides, don't we? I'm on this side and you're on that and we don't agree. But by calling a timeout, you're putting yourself on the same side. You're saying, our marriage is important to us, so we're gonna call a timeout. It's a very positive, strengthening thing to do as a couple. Uh, so I want you to try it, okay? Alrighty, now I want you to try it. So you all have this. I want you to sit down with your spouse. You've got about five, ten minutes. And if you want, you can go next door to that other little room. And this is just the guidelines. But what I want you to come up with is, I want you to come up with a little sign. <laughs> I know this is going to age me tremendously. How many people remember Carol Burnett? She's really old, right? I'm like, I know. Young people don't even know who she is. But she used to have this little sign that she did at the end of her TV show. And she'd always go like this. And that was her way of saying, goodbye to her parents, but nobody else knew, so it was a cute little thing, you know? So I always think it's good for a couple to come up with a little sign like that, that you can do even in public. Because you know like when you're having, you ever have that experience where you're in public, and you're starting to escalate, kind of getting close to a fight with your spouse in public, there's nothing worse, right? Because here you are, a blessed couple, and you're supposed to be perfect, right? So it's good to have a little sign, like, or I don't know, Anything. You could come up with a little physical sign. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Okay, thanks, Larry. Or, or you could come up with a verbal sign. You could say, you know, something that you could say that would be a key that only your spouse would understand, which would be your way of saying, oh, we're in dangerous water here. Let's take a time out. You know? So that's the first thing I want you to do is come up with a sign, either a physical or a verbal sign. Like my husband used to say, we, when we did this, we would say, oops, I thought we were on the same team. So if other people were in the room, they didn't know what we were talking about, but we got it real clear. Oh yeah, we're on the same team, this is ridiculous. We actually agree, why are we fighting? Let's take a time out, you know? So everybody can come up with their own. And then I want you to talk about the possible things you might do to calm down, because that's important, because you need to communicate them. Otherwise, you could easily misinterpret the actions of your spouse. You know, like if, you're, if your spouse likes to go out, you just had a fight and you're taking a time out and your spouse goes outside and closes the door and you think, oh my God, you know. But if you know that he's going out for a walk because he's going to calm down, you don't have to worry. So it's good to share that with each other. Is there something else? Yeah. Yeah, that's it, make a commitment. Come up with a sign, verbal or physical. Talk about the ways that you can calm down and then make a commitment that you'll try it the first time it happens this week, or the first time it happens. Could be two, three, four weeks, I don't know, it depends on your relationship. Okay, so you got a couple of minutes, go. And if you're not with your spouse, find somebody else and just talk about how you might implement it when you go home. Okay, John? <laughs> find somebody else, all right. <laughs>